it is so great to have the incomparable Juan Crucier back on the road to rock. Actually, it's been so long, Juan, since we had you on that the name of the show changed. So welcome to On the Road to Rock for the first time. How are That's you, sir? That's what it is. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, great to be back. Awesome. <laughs> well, it's it's great to have you. You look wonderful. What what's life been like? What have you been up to lately, man? It's been a couple years. What's uh what's the been on the agenda for you, my friend? You know, I, I've just, I've been working a lot on music and uh, had a lot of things I've been doing in the studio, um, staying busy, you know, got the family going on and the kids are growing quick and, you know, it, it just, everything's great. How many kids do you have? I have four. Oh my gosh. I didn't realize you that. That's yeah. wow. What's the, like, yeah. how old's like the youngest one? Well, the youngest one's nine. You oh know, my then, gosh. Oh yeah, yeah. And and then my oldest one is um 30, geez, he's 34. So, you know, it, it's a little bit of a stretch there, but uh so you know, been doing great with the family and enjoying the passage of time. Well, great. It's great to to see and you've kind of kind of been out there making the rounds a little bit since uh you know the the release of this fantastic uh new box set. It's uh, the Atlantic Years Rat, 1984 to 1991 limited edition box set from BMG in partnership with Rhino Entertainment celebrating Rat's massively successful period 1984 to 91 one when i look at this and you think about this box set and you think about that five album run from Rat i think i would put it up against any band from the era and i never really thought about it that much or compared it or like oh how does that compare against Motley Crue but with this box set coming out i I've, I've really looked into it and i'm like i don't know that there's a band that can that can match the, these great albums. Uh, wh what are your thoughts on that? You know, there was a certain chemistry um, on these five records. And um, the first three records really kind of um, sort of set the tone. Um, you know, actually, the EP set the tone. But what, what came after the EP were, were these records. And, you know, we, we were just very fortunate to be able to um, have the, this period of time uh, a lot of things went into it. A lot of things go into a band being successful, right? You know, so um, we had the right record company, you know, um, the the right um, timing and, uh, you know, right production. So a lot of things really kind of sort of um, the confluence of events that occurred um, brought forth the, this, this unique group of records uh, that have you know, withstood the test of time. Absolutely the case. And I, I don't know if you ever heard it was, it's been a year or two ago now. I think, I don't know if you know, Chris Jericho, who's the singer from Fozzie, but he does a podcast. He's a wrestler and he, sure. he did, he did a classic album battle. It was right out of the cellar versus invasion of your privacy. And the tone of that was that like, Oh, well, you know, rat, these two albums are iconic but it was kind of diminishing returns after that. And I, and I, I like vehemently disagree. I think detonator is right up there with uh, some of the best albums you guys did. And that was at the tail end when things were spiraling out of control. So I, I don't agree that, 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 that there were diminishing returns in these albums. I, I love dancing undercover as much as I do out of the cellar and, and same for detonator, honestly. So that's, uh -huh. it's, it's a, it's a, it's a narrative that I don't, that I don't agree with because I think that it, that the qualities remained. Would you agree with well, on that front? Yeah. You know, look, you know, anytime you got a group, um, it's a it's a compromise. Sure. And as the band evolves, you know, there was a big difference from the time that we were playing locally in Hollywood and throughout the greater Los Angeles area as uh, compared to the, you know, when we'd be on a, a tour for 10 or 11, 12 months, you know, um, the, the demands on the group itself. Uh, changed quite a bit. Music changed. Trends changed. There's so many factors that went sure. into it that it's very, very difficult to uh, and, and to say nothing of personal things. You know, people going through changes and and the things that happen in life. So you always strive to make the best record you can under the conditions that you're under at the time. So you know, to say diminishing returns. You know, I mean, everyone's entitled to their opinion, certainly. You know, but um, you know, we, we tried to evolve as the thing. Sure. And do, do you feel like with the release of this box set that it's kind of 
put you back into that world a little bit, like maybe revisiting some of the songs, some of the albums, or just the, you know, reflecting more on, on that time period in your life? Or, or is it just kind of been like, oh, hey, this is a, a great release that has come out to celebrate that period and haven't really thought much more about it. What's been your kind of emotional attachment to this box set? Uh, you know, it's a milestone of sorts, you know, um, it's, it certainly encapsulates a, a magical period of time for rat. Probably it's, um, it, it's, I don't know. I, I, I uh, probably it, it's sweetest years, if you will, you know, um, where things kind of came together. Um, it, um, it, it has a great sound to it. I listened to the tracks as they were being remastered for vinyl. And mm. one of the things that I find unique uh, is that um, I know vinyl's making a comeback, and that's wonderful. It, it's a great thing. The reason it's making a comeback, among many reasons, is because the sound of vinyl is unique unto itself. Nothing else quite sounds like it. Not tape, not cassette tape. Um, certainly not CDs. Mm -hmm. So when you have a, re you know, uh, Andy, a gentleman named Andy Pierce remastered these records and he did a great job. He basically, uh, in layman's terms, he brought out the guitars more and made them more prominent. Now you, you put that kind of sonic signature onto vinyl, which brings out low end and sort of this sort of elegant, you know, uh, sonic quality to it and that makes for a unique and interesting take on five records that were you know a great time for the band's career so um you know there's been different things that have been released over the years and what makes this one unique is that you get the five records you get a unique tour booklet that uh that's what i call it but it's basically a book of it's a history of pictures and uh, all the guys from the group uh, that are still with us here um, went into their archives and sort of, you know, pulled out old pictures. I went into, you know, <laughs> some old, old boxes and started looking at things. And I literally spent days just looking, walking down memory uh -huh. road, you know, and um, found stuff from the early club days all the way until, um, you know, uh, the later years of the band. So, um, it, it's really unique in the sense that it's it's a um, a group of things here that um, it, it, there's been nothing like it that we've ever done before. So so for the uh, the rap fan out there, if there was one thing that you really wanted to sort of, you know, um, prioritize having uh, this would certainly be it because the records are going to sound different. They're going to get mm. you're going to hear things you sort of didn't hear before. And it has other things in it that um you've never seen before so it's an interesting insight into the group oh yeah there's an 11 by 17 uh wanted poster bumper stick a replica backstage pass those won't work these days if you want to see one or go out to see steven piercy you can you're not able to use the backstage pass but it will be a very memorable uh, thing to have in your collection that is amazing and uh of course all yeah. five studio albums one when it comes to bass you know, I'm somebody that's, I'm not a musician. I'm a simple person. So mm -hmm. when I, you know, I'm, I grow up listening to this music and I discover bands like Motley Crue and Poison or, or Dawkin or Rat, Quiet Riot, most of those bands you've been in at one point in time. Um, <laughs> you you yeah. know, I didn't think about the bass and, and what the bass is and what that instrument is. It wasn't maybe until I list, got deeper into Rat and I started hearing a song like Lay It Down or I'm Insane and to really understand the intricacy of what you were doing on those albums. And it's like something I totally appreciate now as an adult that I think that, that, that bass playing and added so much to it. And that's a tough thing to do when you've got a guitar hero, like Warren D Martini in the band, but your bass playing, especially, you know, uh, I don't know, early on really stood out. What, what was the balance like in the studio of trying to get like, we got to get these guitars. We got to get these drums and the bass somehow was able to shine out. Whereas some bands it it, it doesn't. Well, you know, there's a lot of different approaches that you can take with songs. And and thank you. That That's a, a very nice to hear that. Um, look, wh when you're in the studio, you, ha you sort of have to look at the big picture, uh, depending on what the role of the instrument is. And it's sort of a team effort. Mm -hmm. So I deliberately left a lot of space for the guitars to shine above. 
and didn't want to interfere with what the guitar players were attempting to do. I wanted to lay down a really solid foundation and bridge the gap between the drums and the rhythm guitars. So a lot of times I would refrain from overplaying just to give that space to the guitars and even the drums in many times, you know, so, um, you know, it's a type of thing where, you know, I'm a singer songwriter. So I understand the different roles of the instrument and how they, the inner workings together, they're intertwined. And, you know, anytime you have something that you want to feature, you have to set up the background for it to be featured. So I really tried to play with discipline and, and, and play for the song itself, mm. what the song needed. That's a great answer. And that's kind of helps me, you know, as a non-musician to relate to, to that. And I think that's really important. And I mean, something like I'm lo loving use a dirty job when it kicks in, it's a subconscious thing. The bass to me has always been kind of subconscious unless it's like uh, a Lemmy riff or like, you know, the beginning, the intro to Dr. Feel Good or that part and lay it down that boom, boom, boom. I mean, you know, it's there, but to be able to understand those intricacies and in someone like you, I think you were as good as there was when you look back on it, uh, that, that was, that did the instrument in the eighties, my friend, that's, that's, uh, that's the truth. So you I think that you get a lot of praise now, maybe that you were maybe overlooked or, uh, in the eighties, maybe because you had to be the guy on stage moving around all the time. Well, you know, it's it's funny because I come from sort of a jazz fusion progressive mm. background. And so when I was a young musician, um, we sort of judged each other by like, how intricate a song can you play? You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so but then over the years, I started realizing that um, a lot of these um, songs were tailored for the type of band that required that kind of playing. For example, uh, a band like Yes um, was designed for the bass to carry a mm. lot more movement, you know, um, uh, along with many others. You know, you have Rush. Um, yeah. Rush. Yes, absolutely. And and scores of others, you know. Uh, so um, in, in sort of finding that right discipline, to to add what is needed um you, it's it's it requires a lot to sort of not play you know when you want to throw a riff in it's kind yeah. of cool to throw that riff in you know but does it make the song sound better and so i really tried to make it as solid and as uh reliable uh as i could and uh make it easy for everybody else uh, another interesting thing is um i'm i'm a finger player i play with my mm, fingers yeah and on all these, on these five records, um, I play with a pick. So um, it's a different feel and it's a different sound. But when you play with a pick in, in rock, that you can place the bass in a different spot because it has a little more attack and a little more clarity, if you will, um, where the finger is a little more old school and it's a different feel. So... Um, I, I just really try to sort of tailor the bass to the band's needs and create an overall sonic picture that uh, was sort of our fingerprint, if you will. What were the some memories of doing some of the early videos? I mean, uh, Round and Round, of course, is, um, is, is iconic. But to me, the first video I remember seeing as a kid was Wanted Man and just like the fact that <laughs> you had this like Wild West shootout going on. I love <laughs> immersive videos and people like look back on that today is you know Dawkin did a lot of videos like that too burning like a flame they're in fireman outfits they did a video on a volcano like that's just what it was in the 80s mtv had just come out when out of the cellar came right. out so like talk about some of the early memories of of doing those videos because like they just live on and in, in this iconic realm today well let me tell you something you may not often hear um when we would do these videos i learned really really quickly that they were going to be really difficult to make. They were going to be very demanding. Uh, a lot of it is what you would typically um, sort of think, but some of it was, you know, something you may not have anticipated, and that was hurry up and wait, all right? So typically when the, these videos um, started happening for groups, uh, there was a, a new, you know, MTV and various other smaller video channels were starting to spring up. Mm -hmm. And so bands were starting to make videos for these outlets and you had to cram a lot into a little bit of time. 
So the hours were extremely long. They were very demanding. I remember when we did um, the lay it down video, um, it was the next morning. It was daylight outside. And we were inside this this uh, movie studio, you know, taping the final live performance. You know, when, uh, you know, I mean, we've been at it for maybe you know, well over 24 hours and everybody was just like, you know, at this point, you know, sleep deprived and you had to go out there and like an athlete, give it your all uh, to, to capture everything that the director needed. Sure. So uh, the expense of these videos were such that you really couldn't do it over several days. Many times you had to sort of co uh, compartmentalize and compress everything together. So one thing about videos <laughs> that I always felt kind of going in was, wow, this is going to be a long day. Here comes another one, you know? Yeah. Like at a live performance, you get that immediate interaction from the fans. You're just in it. It's the energy you're on stage an hour and a half. And it's just, it, it's then people always talk about how different it is when you're making a movie, make it a commercial, make it a video. It's just like this, you don't get that immediate gratification, that reward. It's like, Oh, but you see the finished product. You're like, that's why we did all that. That was yeah. awesome. <laughs> no, you know, and you're totally right. And the one thing about playing live is that you, you know, everything's geared around the live show that day and night. So you go out there and you play for an hour and a half or an hour and 45 minutes, whatever the case may be. And you know that you're done for the night. When you're shooting a video, you go out there and you shoot a certain scene, then you do a certain live scene. And you're pretty much getting like to the point where you're going, okay, man, I'm glad, I'm glad we're done. And all of a sudden the director goes, wait, we're not done yet. Hang out for another five hours and then we're going to have you do another live performance. So, you know, you, you just sort of have to adapt, but it, it was a unique um, sort of skill set of pacing yourself while trying to deliver your maximum, you know? Mm. Um, so, you know, and, and again, you know, um, they're all different in their own ways. Um, and some of them were a blast, like wanted man, you know, um, that was a lot of fun to shoot, you know, only because it was like, you know, shot in a little Western town and, and uh, we got to ride some horses and <laughs> kind of shoot have a some guns. Fun. And I, I don't, guns, I don't right? think they'd let that fly today in a video. Yeah, firing guns around. Not. <laughs> probably That's not. why I prefer the eighties though. You could do anything you wanted. That's right. Yeah. Well, almost. <laughs> <dangerous>. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I got to ask you because uh, to this day, and I just watched this movie uh, last week. I watch it every summer, which is Point Break. Nobody Writes oh, yeah. for Free has been a top five rat song for me for uh, really since the song came out in 91 as a single. Right. The thing about that is that that, that was like the literal end of the band. Just that video was about the last we would see from rap for some time in that incarnation. Just kind of talk about that song, how it came about and the, the it, you know, the fact that things ended the way they did so quickly. And that like, I just always like to imagine what things would have been like, had you been able to build off that song into a new album after that? Hey, that's a, that's a, a what if in rock and roll history, but. Great yeah. Song. You know, yeah. That, that, that song was definitely a, a bookmark of sorts. Yeah. Um, the history of it was unique. Uh, our management company at the time told us, hey, there's an opportunity um, to uh, record this song that um, I'll try to just stick to the main points. It's kind of a long story. Sure. So we were told basically that we could, um, you know, work on this song, um, change it any way we could or needed to, that we would get writing credit and everything would be copacetic. And so, um, you know, we, we went ahead and, and made some very, very significant changes to the song. Um, and originally, it was sort of a, a, a droney keyboard demo. Hmm. Um, and not to take away from the original writer, all due respect, you know, uh, music is art and whatever way art comes out in whatever fashion, it's all good, right? It's art, you know, but we're a hard rock band. Yeah. You know, with no keyboards. You know? So we had to sort of interpret that. And we needed a bigger hook and we needed a pre-chorus and a tag um, of which I wrote. And um, Warren added some things, obviously uniquely his as a guitar guitarist, guitar player. Um, and so we changed the lyrics, the melodies and so forth. So there was a significant change. And... Um, uh, you know, it was the last thing that we recorded. And the interesting thing about it, 
um, is that um, when we did it, Warren did all the guitars. Uh, at that point, Robin was no longer with us. Right. And um, I did all the backgrounds alone by myself. So that took a little bit of, um, no, nah, I mean, it just, yeah. I just layered them, you know. And so it brought a unique snapshot of the band in a way that was never seen before. And I totally agree with you. Um, you know, uh, by the way, Mick Kozowski was the um, engineer producer and mm -hmm. he was a, a mixing engineer. He'd re remix other people, you know. Uh, you know, other songs to make them hit singles. But I, I totally agree with you that it was a, a unique song that, you know, was sort of um, the, um, uh, what would you say, um, a, a look at what could have been beyond that, you know, a snapshot of what could have come. Exactly. Yeah. So it was a very condensed version of Rat because uh, it was just the four of us at the time. Um, you know, Mick really didn't have um, anything to do with the pre-production of the song. We demoed it at my studio um, and that the demo came out great. And then uh, once we, we got Mick involved, um, then we had, uh, you know, we, we, of course, went to another studio to do a full band recording and the version that you hear today. It, it's iconic to me. I love that song. And I, I think that like, I don't know if you've ever heard this before, but to me, music is so immersive and I like, you know, it, it puts me in a time and a place or a mood or whatever. Rat yes. to me is the ultimate summertime band. When I hear <laughs> Warren's guitar, when I hear Steven's voice, it is summertime. And I don't know, was that ever like something that was conscious or I don't know if, if, if it's just me being the way I am and the weird seasonal person uh, in, in Missouri, we do get all the four seasons. So I'm like, Hey, in the fall, I love football and pumpkins and Halloween. So I don't right. know. Was there, was there anything to that? Have you ever heard anyone say that before? <laughs> you know, it, it, I'll tell you, rat was always a good time band. Right. You know, and that's... We, we didn't really get into um, any really, really heavy subjects or anything to do with, uh, for example, politics or, you know, some type of, um, you know, stance, we, we just wanted to have the people have a great time with us, party, celebrate their lives, sort of give them a break from the trials and tribulations that life can sort of, uh, you know, throw at us. So uh, to say that we're a good time sort of summer band, that's a great look at it. You know, I mean, I wouldn't disagree with you. Yeah. And just the L.A., the Sunset Strip, all those images that like in my head as a youngster that I'd never been to LA. I, I didn't, all I knew was like what I'd see in movies. And like, I see these evocative images and I watch like the movie point break and the rat songs in there and the rat video looks like the movie point break. And I'm just like yeah. all this stuff and this, uh, the beaches and it all just sort of like clicked together for me. And I think rat embodied that. And it does to this day, every time I've, playing rat like I, my girlfriend's a huge fan too and i'm just like it's summertime we're we're blasting rat down to the lake or whatever like it just and it just yeah. hits you know um you rejoined the band of course in 2012 you guys had moments 2016 you had a very successful tour Tr tried it again in 2018 we've had steven on this show not long ago obviously not trying to like dig up any you know hey give me some breaking news Are you guys ever what's kind of just the the status for you like is it would you ever want to try again i mean steven said hey i do it if we get the original members together you're one of those members one so i guess we got to ask you you know I, I i appreciate that clint you know and um look rad has had a very long history hasn't it yes you know and um, at, at this point, there are certain things that I, I just don't want to get into. And yeah. it's no other reason than um, it would be inappropriate when I'm trying to just kind of like let people know about this awesome box. Set. Yes, sure. You know, um, I, I just think that, um, you know, we need to sort of, uh, you know, just kind of like leave. Well, let me just stop. I I, <laughs> <How's that? laughs> I, 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 I that's what I expected one. And I, and I, it's, you know, I had to ask it in some way. Uh, it's yeah. just like, you know what I mean? And um, because uh, you know, we have spoken to other, uh, you know, Steven has been on the show and he's kind of always been open about what he, what he feels. And he goes out and does his thing. You're doing music. I think that's great. And like, you're right. Celebrating the legacy is, is important. And I think rats legacy is amongst the best from what in my opinion is one of the most important time periods in rock history, which is that eighties part. In fact, actually we have a question from our Facebook page. 
That's from our friend Shaggy Shane Williams. And he has a question for you. And I think I know the answer to this because just you were in both Rat and Dawkin for like 18 months. So I'm assuming that the timing was the answer to this. But he asked, when did you know that you needed to leave Dawkin for Rat and why? Well, that's a great question. And um, and listen, you know, all good. OK, so, I, you know, I just there's certain things I like focusing on, um, you know, with intention. And um, I think that the band's legacy, the group, uh, I want to just say one one last thing here. The group that recorded these five records was a very good band. I, I would never denigrate that or take anything away from that band. Sure. Um, so the thing is, uh, in life, things change, things evolve. And and so um, I, I like to just keep the focus on the on the positive stuff. I don't like to speculate about anything. So um, in answer to your question, having said that, um, it was a really difficult decision because mm. I had been in, in both bands a long time, Rat and Dawkin. Yeah. And, you know, when you have a a commitment and sort of your time becomes an investment, right? You know? Sure. And we had a record deal in Dawkin and rat did not have a record deal. Uh, we had done an EP, but there was no record deal guaranteed. And of course that was the big, you know, the big brass ring that everyone was trying to grab because that meant that you could sort of do what, uh, what so many others had done, including Van Halen. You know, so um, it became really difficult because it wasn't a simple answer. Um, but the best way I can put it is after a lot of soul searching, after a lot of uh, just, you know, speculating and just trying to sort of extrapolate um, what might occur, um, I decided that it, I was a better fit. I was more at home with rat. Uh, if that makes any sense, you know, anytime you have a band, it, it all bands require a unique set of skill sets. So um, the dynamics within the band will require you to act and perform and contribute in a unique way to, for that band. So um, I just felt that overall rap was a better fit for me stylistically as a musician uh, and uh, and uh, live and the the way we got along was also positive. So a lot of factors went into it, and as you can clearly hear, it wasn't a simple decision. <laughs> it, it's it's crazy because uh, these days people do it a lot. There's a lot of people. I mean, Red Beach is in White Snake and Winger, and you know does it. But back then it was like that was almost unheard of because of the. I mean the record deals, you know, the, the music business was so demanding and the time was so demanding, but you were able to do that for 18 months. Did it, was it just like an internal thing? Like I got to make a decision or was, was there like a pressure, like make a decision one, which way are we going here? Or was it like you deciding? You no, to... no, I, I, I definitely decided. And, and yeah. look, what happened was um, in Dawkins, we had um, a, a, a management team of Cliff Bernstein and Peter Minch. And if those names sound familiar, it's yeah. because they manage Metallica. So they managed Dawkins back in the day and they were excellent managers, really, really cl clever and um, visionaries. And so we really had a, a, a situation that um, I, there was sort of a, like I'd be giving up something that I, I sort of, you know, gave a lot of time to uh, on something that maybe wasn't guaranteed to happen, you know? Um, but so, you know, it, it, there wasn't a specific moment, right? but th there were a lot of um, sort of clues. For example, I did the EP and then management said, okay, you know, you have to sort of um, leave the group after that because people are starting to think that you're in that band and not in Dawkins. Well, the situation at the time was, was that Dawkins wasn't playing live. Mm. So, you know, I just wanted to play some shows and make a little bit of extra money because the truth is, is that I was a starving musician. And back then a lot of musicians did, they network, you know, there wasn't like the internet and phones and things, you know, cell phones. You had to do a lot of legwork. You had to show up in person and, you know, see what band was doing what. And, uh, you know, so it required a lot of effort. 
uh, to stay alive, <laughs> you know, and <laughs> with hopes of succeeding someday. And so when I did go ahead and make the decision, it was really based on uh, um, what I thought had the most potential for my skill set. And one of the turning points for me was when uh, I believe it was Robin and Steven came over when the EP was finally finished and pressed, right? So we recorded the EP. I had to leave the group. Didn't see him for a while. They finally come over with the finished product. I put it on my turntable and I set down the needle on the vinyl. And I just, and it was like, wow, this is really good. Oh. It was raw. It was nasty. It was in your face. You know, um, it was just everything that I was hoping it would be. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You know, <laughs> So that started that. making it, you know, that started kind of making it easier for me to make that decision, you know. So, you know, these, you know, you always try, well, back then, we're talking such a long time ago, you know, it really, for a lot of folks, you know, it was do or die. It was work a day job or make it in a rock band or work a day job, go to college, get your degree and work in a rock band. <laughs> Too many steps there. <laughs> yeah. So th that was sort of the dilemma for, for several. Um, and of course, there was the ever popular, you know, make it in a band or sleep on your friend's couch. Right. You know, so um, that was sort of one of the components of it. Absolutely. Oh, that great answer there. And thanks for the question. Shaggy Shane, he always uh, he's a little older than me. So he's he's in tune with that era like nobody I know. So thank you, Shaggy Shane. Thank you. Uh, before we let you go, Juan, and you've been so gracious with your time, and it's been so great to catch up, I want to make sure everybody uh, knows the uh, rat, Atlantic Years box set, 84 to 91. It's a uh, limited edition, and it is out through BMG in partnership with Rhino Entertainment. Before we let you go, Juan, we got our final four drum roll, which is four quick questions. We'll have some fun. Give us whatever comes to mind. All right. You got okay. It. People always say rat uh, you know, that what was missing? What, what, why didn't rat become, you know, Motley Crue galactic, he, you know, was it the ballad was giving yourself away? Should that have been the ballad that went over the top for rat? You know, again, it's hard for me to speculate because it's so subjective, right? So that was a song that, um, that had a, a participation from Diane Warren and Desmond child. And, uh, you know, I mean, you know, they're superlative writers um they're amazing so it it a lot of times it's timing sure. and it's how the song uh is performed so you know it, in music when you're making a song uh and i'm sorry i'll, I'll make a quick no it's cool it's uh, good it, you not only have to you know perform it and sing it but you sort of have to get it across to where the 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 listener um uh, can, can really relate to it. Okay. And so there's a lot of factors. I don't know if that would have made a difference. And uh, certainly um, uh, giving yourself away is an excellent, is a very well-written song. Let's just say that. I love it. You know? Love that song. Um, yeah. I, I, it's still, it's still a go-to. Okay. So in LA in the sunset strip, Motley Crue uh, kind of had uh, their home base they played everywhere. You guys all played all the clubs. Motley Crue, probably best known for the whiskey. What what would you say yeah. Rat's home club was? Was it the whiskey? Was it the Troubadour? Did you have one that you preferred? Uh, when it comes to Rat, uh, most of my memories, um, and, and there are numerous, but but the one club I tend to gravitate to would be the Troubadour. Sure. Great. Yeah. Um, there was a time that, you know, we were playing and there weren't that many folks showing up. And I remember one time I was pulling up in my truck and um, we're like looking at me and uh, the, the drummer and we're looking and we're going, Hey, there's a line of people. Oh, it must be that restaurant next door to the Troubadour. And then as we're getting close, we're going, no, it looks like it's a line for the Troubadour. looks like there's a line to see us. <laughs> see us. <laughs> I love it. We were kind of we were shocked, you know? Oh, I love that. Um, <laughs> well, Zoom's going to cut it off, cut us off in two minutes. We got to go quick. What okay. is uh, the first concert you ever attended in, uh, in the States, in America? Uh, it would be my brother's band, the Symbols of Time, back when I was about uh, five or six years old in wow. Torrance, California. Yeah. 
that that's awesome. Uh, yeah. I love that. What, what was the first album you bought with your own money or that you stole either one? Uh, <laughs> it was, yeah, right. well, right. um, let's see. It was, uh, the single called take it easy for the Eagles. Well, that is a, <laughs> you, you say that almost like it's, that was like a very obscure song or something. That's just kind of, you're like, no, this, no, hey, no. there's a song called take it easy. <laughs> I just you saw know, Travis no, Tritt perform that. <laughs> That's funny. I was only thinking, did I buy the single first right, or, or did I buy album. the album? And sure. I remember me, me and a friend of mine went to Sears, okay, back when it was a, you know, a buy all whatever you want store. Um, and he bought Bill Withers' Lean on Me and I bought Take It Easy by the Eagles. Awesome. And went home and put it on and it just changed my life. I love that. I love oh, that yeah. story. Juan, you, you've been so gracious and I thank you so much thank for you. coming back on. Um, I always appreciate you are always so responsive and to be able to get a hold of you. And I'm just like, you know, Juan, I really want to talk about this box set and I wanted to do it with you because it's been so long and um, the, the box set hadn't come out uh, when I talked to Steven last. So thank you so much yeah. for doing this and best of continued success. Best of luck, continued being a dad and doing all the family stuff. You're a, you're, you're a true great one, man. You're just a good guy. And I appreciate you. Well, thank you, Clint. It's been a pleasure. It's great to be back. Good luck on your show. And if there's anything you need, you know, always feel free to reach out. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Juan. Take it easy. And we'll catch up soon, my friend. Have a great day. You too.